the shock goes in stages. Havana in the 50s was one world-class city. Going to Miami in 1960 was not what Miami is today, and certainly nothing like Havana. It's hard to fully appreciate what happened on that island six decades ago. Fulgencio Batista, while being completely corrupted by outside interests, still managed to maintain a standard of living in Cuba comparable to some European countries of the time. You know, Cuba, man, listen, you would mention Havana. It was like saying Paris, London, and, and Havana, all in the same thing as far as cultural experiences. And yet Batista's excesses were so vile that he encountered violent rebellion. Batista murdered 20,000 Cubans in seven years, and he turned democratic Cuba into a complete police state, destroying every individual liberty, according to JFK. And as the rebellion grew, Batista became more and more violent and paranoid. He was paranoid of students, organized labor, and miners who had access to dynamite. My father, in the mid to late 50s, was part of the revolutionary movement in Cuba. Like him, like many others, were disenchanted with the regime in Cuba of Batista. A los 26, 28 años, me contrataron para una mina. Una noche se me apareció ese señor que ya era, tenía fama. Some military guy they sent from Batista's people who had already killed five people. He tells the guy who was in charge there at the gate to, to bring him one person from the mine because he wanted to set an example. Sí, yo le dije, mira, si eso es así, dile que soy yo el que voy. Because if that's what he wants, then it will be me. Un, I'm going to be the one that goes. I'm not going to send one of my... Hacer un, 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 un muerto inocente. Ya cerramos la mina. Y porque teníamos, teníamos muchos problemas. Yo tenía también muchos problemas. Estaba escondiendo a la gente por la montaña. I never understood why the revolution, man. Because all the people, no matter how poor, in my opinion, they lived a pretty good life. There was a lot of corruption going on, but that, has, that hasn't gotten solved. In the mountains, Fidel Castro and his rebel army gathered the nationalist rural and poor Cubans who felt that Batista had sold them out to foreign interests. To be Cuban implies a duty. Not to fulfill that duty is treason, Castro said in his famous trial speech. He charmed the international media by pointing to Batista's human rights abuses and assuring them that he was not a communist. They said your army was communist and that you were communist. How do you I will explain? never be against any right. At least may think in politics. Very good. Not communist. Do you think the affairs about the Communist Party being revived here are valid? Nah, at least on the failest of reason. You can be surely that Batista will be the last dictator of Cuba. The biggest problem that happened in Cuba, of course, was Castro. He took something that was once considered a family business and made it into this machine to feed one bank account. After Fidel actually won and had control of Cuba, that's when people started to realize, well, you know, things aren't happening the way they should be happening. My father uh, saw that right away and was able to, to leave Cuba. Uh, but there were others that didn't. Well, I was at the offices in Havana when we were intervened. It was on a Saturday morning. My father had taken my brother and I to the office because he was going to work. On that Saturday morning, a jeep showed up at the door, four armed guards and a guy with a very thin tie and a white shirt. They walked in, they put a government stamp on the safe to deposit box. Uh, my dad was, was buying a, a huge amount of, of tobacco from the Castro regime, and he basically had told everyone, he says, that we're going to buy this, we're, we're, you're, there's not going to be anything left here to do, OK? So he saw, he saw the writing on the wall. My grandfather was actually poached out of his house with my grandmother being there and uh, for absolutely doing nothing except loving America and being a non-communist. My grandfather was very angry at John F. Kennedy because he assumed, like a lot of the guys that were in the jails, many being Americans, that 
the Americans would, would help and get him out. Our objection with Cuba is not over the people's drive for a better life. Our objection is to their domination by foreign and domestic tyrannies. Everything was uncertain. Castro nationalized the cigar industry, making the Cuban government the sole client for Cuban tobacco farmers, dictating production quotas in spite of market demands and redistributing farmland to other crops like sugar. Some families were allowed to continue. Many lost everything. I can remember uh, as a senior in high school coming home and finding my mother had cots in our living room for the people that were coming in. I was driving from, uh, from Tampa to uh, West Palm Beach to pick up anybody that would come over. It was coming over on boats and, and bringing them back. So we had dozens of, of families that, were, that, uh, that lived around us. They were like part of our family. When, when Castro came in, his, his big thing was, I'm going to produce so many hundreds of tons of sugar, which he never hit, incidentally. They took over lands where, where it was growing tobacco and put them in sugar. They never rotated them. The farms disappeared. Of the key farmers that were in Cuba, the Aroas, the Rodriguez family, the Placencia family, the Curas, all those came out. The father of the actually Placencia, Nestor Placencia, was a very, very close friend of my grandfather. When they arrived the revolution, the government take the land to the Placencia family. So he don't have nothing. And every day, my grandpa drive to Placencia house just to give the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So my grandfather would have to move without nothing with his wife and his two, and his two kids. One of them was my father. In April of 1961, they were told when they showed up, don't come back. They went to the airport and left. Tampa was the fine cigar capital of the world. One time it had over 150 cigar factories. By the time we came down to Tampa in 53, there were still 10 big, large, family-owned cigar manufacturers all making Cuban cigars. The Cuban filler, Cuban binder, and Cuban wrapper. You gotta remember, our family today is a 106-year-old family business. We're the oldest Cuban-American family run the cigar industry for so many years. A uh, family of old Tampa, Ybor City, the cigar capital of the world at once. And it's true, my grandfather, he sold cigars on a cash-only basis. And uh, he had his accounts uh, receivable and everything in a rubber band rolling in his pocket. When my father started up, before I was around it, there was about uh, 50, 52 factories. There was the, the huge market for tobacco here. In fact, I would say that most of the Cuban tobacco came here to Tampa. The amount of handmade cigars that were made here before Castro and the, the quality of the people that came over here and the quality of the cigars coming out of here were just as good as they were coming out of Cuba. The Tampa cigar business was really solid until the Cuban embargo. There was panic in the streets. One by one, the factories closed, sold out, moved offshore. So Castro comes in, takes over the country, and then all of a sudden you see this explosion of exiled families and U.S.-based manufacturers trying to fill the void that was left in the market because of the embargo. By 1961, U.S.-Cuban relations were rapidly declining. Eisenhower had been preparing the infamous Bay of Pigs operation, and Castro had been publicly warming up to the Soviets. <laughs> Even showing up to the UN General Assembly in New York City on a Soviet jet in 1960. Why are you going to run an Simply because Soviet Nicaragua are our friends. And here, you took our friends. Here in the United States, you, the authority, broke our friends. I found Fidel charming and frankly brilliant. I've always been sort of against the embargo uh, because the Cuban people are some of the hardest working, most honest, best educated people on earth, and they love America. And the problem is between governments, it's politics. It's not between American people and Cuban people. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my name is Marvin Shankin. I have a number of publications, including Cigar Aficionado, which I founded in 1992. I've interviewed a wide range of people, for the most part, who love cigars, who don't give interviews. Cigar Aficionado brought the cigar experience to pop culture, with many publications soon to follow. The first word that comes to mind to describe the overall industry would be class. It's a big family. Anybody that works in the industry, from the manufacturers to the growers to the consumers, um, they're just, they're classy people and it's an environment where you can feel safe. It doesn't matter what you do for a living, whether, you know, blue collar, white collar, what your religion is, where you come from, what language you speak, there's a common thread and that's the cigars. And it, it really is true. I mean, you leave all that at the door and you just light up a cigar, you kind of put your guard down and you just, you make friends that become friends for life. It's crazy through the smoking cigars together. It's just the people that to my normal day-to-day -day living, I wouldn't have never had the opportunity to meet doctors, uh, Saudi prince, uh, professional athletes. It's really a conversation piece, man. When you're successful in life and you take your hand at, at things and, and you learn about different affluent cultures, if you will, and Cuban cigars is definitely at the top of that list. I've thought about it and thought about it, and I said, you know what? Fire. It's in our DNA. I'm convinced that this reminds us of the campfire days. And so this, to me, represents the modern day campfire. There's nothing more soothing than that. And I think it's just, there's something deep within each cell of our body that reminds us of the day of the campfire. I'm sitting in this cigar shop and I'm talking to five or six guys. We're all sitting around and there's this older distinguished gentleman sitting to my left. And I start striking up a conversation with this older gentleman on my left. And we all start talking about football, our wives, family, Towards the end of the conversation, I realized that the older man on my left, man, he looks very familiar. How do I know that guy? It ended up being George Tennant, at the time, the head of the CIA. And here he is, just shooting the breeze with all us regular blue collar folks. That only happens in the cigar community. It doesn't happen anywhere else. That's what makes the cigar world the best community, hands down. Even though you travel to different areas and different shops, the dynamics don't change. You have your locals, the people that just go all the time. The conversations, whether it's around sports, politics, movies, whatever it may be, because you develop a friendship based not around who you are a lot of times, but it's based around a cigar. Even though the faces may change, the essence of what we're doing is still the same. It's all about the cigar. I can solve all the world problems once I have a cigar in my hand. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it sounds good. Imagine if Trump sat down right now with Putin over a glass of bourbon or scotch and smoked a cigar. I guarantee you we could solve a lot of problems that are going on in the world. So what a premium cigar allows you to do is sit in a civilized place, talk to friends, regardless of race, religion, across all social structures, and talk about life, politics, sports. Uh, I look at it as a form of meditation. When you learn about this industry, it's hard not to fall in love with it. When you see all the all the steps, you know, how the tobacco is grown, how the tobacco have different different position of the plants, and every position has its own characteristics, how you blend the cigar, how you fermented the tobacco, how you age it, how you make the cigar, how the skills of the people to make out of a rough leaf a, a beautiful piece of art, how you packaging, you know, all the passion that is beside it, it's hard not to fall in love with it. I love to experiment with new blends and new brands, one-off projects like the Monster Series. I think the creativity part is, is like writing a song. I think it's necessary for our industry to keep on growing by doing things like this. But with the dynamic of the government coming in and the FDA trying to control the industry and not allowing that craft, it's almost like taking a songwriter and telling them that they can never write another song again. In 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration announced that it would begin regulating premium handmade cigars like they had done with cigarettes, erroneously citing youth use statistics which clearly referred to flavored cigars, not handmade premium cigars. In their reports, surveyed youths said they smoked these cigars because they came in flavors they liked and because they were affordable. There's really no case to be made against premium handmade cigars uh, according to their thesis. 
Young people are not smoking premium handmade cigars. They're smoking 99 cent blunts, baby. When you, we talk about FDA, we have to talk about the impact on the premium cigar industry, which is what, what we're concerned with. And that's our business. You know, when you look at the, the large cigar category, which is a, a big category, we're talking about premium handmade cigars, which is just a fraction, tenths of a percent maybe, of what the total industry is. Basically what we're asking for is an exemption for the premium handmade cigar industry. There are no children that are smoking this category of cigars. And if we do get an exemption for this category, none of the bad actors that are making little cigarettes, making uh, other machine-made products would get into this category. And what the anti-groups try to do is convolute the message. It smells like a yummy. It smells like strawberry. Given that 80% of kids who ever use tobacco started with a flavored product, who do you think tobacco companies are targeting? We get to keep them. <laughs> I've never seen a kid get started on cigars. I'm the most centrist voter in the United States Senate. If it makes sense, I vote for it. This one doesn't make sense, trying to regulate an industry out of existence. The relationship between tobacco and Western culture has been a tumultuous one. It goes back to the discovery of America. When the Europeans traveled across the Atlantic Ocean looking for riches, for spices, for gold, whatever they were looking for, they landed here in Hispaniola, in the Caribbean. What did they find? They found the natives. And what was their gold? What was their treasure? Their tobacco. Their tobacco was used for social reasons, to bring people together. Tobacco is religious. Tobacco was used by the natives for religion. It still is. Cigars are so synonymous with tradition that in the Cuban dialect, the word tobacco refers to both the plant and the cigar itself. In the tobacco industry as a whole, the premium handmade sector is alone in honoring culture, tradition, and heritage. When our ancestors smoked their traditional cigars, which was the brown leaf of tobacco, dry leaf of tobacco, rolled, they would lit it up, and that fire, which generated smoke, which rose to the heaven, was their direct connection with the gods. So it had a very strong spiritual meaning to them, and we continue to value that because ultimately cigar smoking, cigar enjoyment, is a very intimate thing, but in a way it connects us, all of us, cigar lovers, cigar smokers, with something bigger. It is no great irony that government intervention today propagates that tumultuous history. Regulation actually lines the pockets of big tobacco, just as the colonial powers once lined the pockets of the slave trade. I have to be very careful and politically correct, but you know, certain companies benefit. Big companies are doing their job. They want regulation, they love that, they don't say it, but that's the way they can cut down competition. It may sound like hyperbole to distinguish premium cigars, which are often flaunted by the rich and famous, from big tobacco, but the numbers are telling. Approximately 700 million cigars are sold worldwide every year. While that number may seem high, that's about how many cigarettes are sold every hour of every day. I can't be around a cigarette myself, and I have nothing, it's a legal product, I have nothing against someone who enjoys cigarettes. I respect everybody's wishes and choices because that's something I was taught as an American, the freedom of choice. But when people say tobacco's tobacco, it's not true. It's like saying a chimpanzee is the same as a dolphin. They're both mammals, but one lives in the ocean, the other lives in a the tree. They're not the same. Cigar is, you smoke cigars just for pleasure. People smoke cigarettes because they have a lot of stress. But cigars, you smoke when you are in a quiet time, in a quiet place, then you enjoy the life. Cigarette making is a highly mechanized process from harvest to smoke. A factory producing 20,000 cigarettes per minute requires only a handful of people to monitor the machinery. Premium cigars, on the other hand, are a different story altogether. There is a lot of fucking things that make a cigar a cigar. We're in the business of producing quality products and we're not looking at how many cigars we make. Some secrets, I can tell you because it's secrets. 
los secretos no se dicen. Se escogen las mejores plantas para las mejores semillas. Ya por experiencia uno tiene las distintas zonas de tabaco donde puedes plantar cada semilla. Cada semilla tiene su zona destinada, porque una zona te aporta más aroma, otras te aportan más fortaleza y otras te aportan más combustión. If you actually took and made cigars just from Nicaraguan tobacco, you have the ability to make thousands and thousands and thousands of blends. There's so many different dynamics. It's not just varietal. It's not just region. It's not just farm. It's also plots on those farms. Plot A might work better than plot B. El punto más importante precisamente es tú conocer lo que da cada uno de las zonas. ¿Qué aporta? qué proporción tú puedes poner para lograr un equilibrio, para lograr una liga que pueda complacer a más exigente los paladares. Sucede igual que en el vino. En el vino usted está en Logroño, está en cualquier lugar de eso donde se produce buen vino. Y eh, una plantación es buena y la del lado no es buena. Say on average about 39 months from the time the seed goes in before it's a finished cigar. But secos are light tobaccos, take anywhere between 18 and 24 months. Visa, which is in the middle part of the bush, which produces most of our medium strength fillers, binders, and sun-grown wrappers, take anywhere between 24 and 36 months. And lijeros, which are the, the tobaccos on the top of the plant that produce the most richness. Even though the youngest leaf on the plant, they've always had sun exposure, so they're the most powerful. They'll take anywhere between you know, 36 months up to 60 months, depending on its texture. So if you juxtapose that, you kind of amortize that between all of it, you're looking probably around 39 months. This is like a labor of love, and you got to wait for the tobacco, and the tobacco will tell you when it's ready. You can take the same tobaccos from the same farm and give them to me or give them to somebody like George Padron, and the way we cure it, the way we ferment it, we're going to get two totally different types of products, just like a winemaker who will cure, ferment the grapes in a different manner, have their own processes in making the wine, the barrels they use. I can probably name a blend right here, and I'm confident to know that not one other manufacturer could put together that same blend. There's a lot of us that have tobacco in Nicaragua, but not everybody makes the same tasting cigar. You know, from having the tobacco to making the cigar, that range in between, that's where the magic happens, and that's where you have to know what you're doing. You have to be consistent in your philosophy. Cuando cogía los matules de tabaco, decía, denle bastante cuero, el tabaco es como la mujer, que hay que pasarle bastante la mano. Y que cuando se le pasa la mano, se ponen mejor. <laughs> knowing the land, knowing the tobacco, knowing the characteristics of the leaf in one area or the other and begin to play with the years, really a good cigar, we need a lot of blending. Once it's done out of the farm, then it goes into a whole other world of fermentation and processing and making sure that tobacco is properly aged before it gets put into the cigar. And then, are they going to be rolling it in accordion bunching and to bar? How are they bunching? So that changes the flavor and the dynamic of the cigar. There's so many variables in cigar making that it's almost impossible for one cigar maker to try to copy another cigar maker. Once Castro nationalized the cigar industry at minimum, he fractured the deep heritage of the traditional Cuban brands. While those families that left have been able to start over and write their own destinies, many old traditional Cuban brands have become portfolio items of the government machine. One of the oldest and most established Cuban tobacco families decided to weather the storm and try to save their farm and family legacy by remaining in Cuba. Well, my name is Hiroshi Robaina. We are here in the Vega Robaina plantation today. I'm here with my grandfather, Alejandro Robaina. My grandfather was a very, very smart and intelligent man. We survived that situation. My father knew the Robinas. He's just one of the guys, I think, that stayed there a lot. I think most of the people that I know left. De Cuba se han llevado los mejores productores de tabaco para República Dominicana, para Nicaragua. It was bad for everybody, man. Bad. The cost is very high because when something doesn't exist, price is growing and growing and growing. One day, his tractor was broken inside the, the plantation, and he just called to the company. And next day, in the first flight, arrived the, the part of the tractor 
was broken, and also with the mechanic from the United States. And now you imagine it's uh, Russia or China. Do you imagine it's another part of the world? Uh, we have the more powerful country, 45 minutes. Bueno, muchísimas cosas que le han sucedido. Porque realmente es muy difícil para un campesino como mi papá, que lo que tenía era segundo grado de escolaridad, de pronto sentirse en contacto con el mundo entero. Es, es difícil. One time in Italy, we be there with many farmers from, from Italy. They produce one kind of tobacco, the name they call Toscano cigars. So many journalists around. So one of the journalists asked to my grandfather, in front of all peoples, why his tobacco, Toscano, the, the insect doesn't eat, and why the Cuban tobacco, the insect eat? So, but my grandfather very, very fast, he said because the insect didn't eat shit. Que dice que me, dice mi papá que fund, fumaba escondido de su, de su padre, ¿no? de mi abuelo. Y que el primero que se fumó, vomitó y hasta se hizo caca, ¿no? Porque el tabaco da una, una gran borrachera, uno se emborracha, que es más mala que la de ron cuando no sabe fumar. A few years back, um, I got to sit down and have a cigar with Alejandro Rabina at his farm. Well, he brought out this big tin, this metal tin. He's like, let me make you something. So he got out, rolled it. He's like, here, try this. And just smoking that was one of the most was one of the most strongest cigars I've ever had. It was just amazing the flavor and just that that moment that time that I got to sit with him and just talk with him. And I actually brought him a, a Padron Anniversario, 1926, number one. He saw it, he kissed it, and he kind of almost had a little tear in his eye. And he put it right back in his pocket, right up over his heart. He was just like, "My friend, my friend." Cuando Pavarotti le cantó una canción a mi papá por teléfono y el viejo estaba sentado en la, en la taza del baño y yo le llevé el teléfono. Son cosas increíbles que nos han sucedido en la vida. Y trataba a todo el mundo por igual, era un hombre muy sencillo. My grandpa, he's a legend. That man was my, my grandpa, of course, my boss, my teacher, and also my friend. I've been with him during many years, all the time. We travel around the world together. So he was the, the most important man for me in my life. The families that stayed in Cuba were not the only ones experiencing problems. In the decades after the embargo, those families who relocated took great risks to rebuild in uncertain areas with uncertain economies as Latin America became a battleground for the United States and the Soviet Union. The nations of Latin America have never previously been subjected to a potential nuclear threat. But this extraordinary buildup of communist missiles cannot be accepted by this country. To halt this offensive buildup, all ships of any kind bound for Cuba will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. My dad uh, came to the U.S. with nothing. In Cuba, we, his family, they used to be tobacco growers. After struggling and doing all sorts of odd jobs, he, he mowed lawns, he did carpentry work, and he was able to save the money to start this company with one cigar roller, which was $600. He passed a lot of work with the school, he passed a lot of work with the league, but I found the perfect league in Nicaragua. The link between us, Nicaraguans, and Padron was done through Roberto Martinez, my God. The Inter-American Development Bank gave the government of Nicaragua a loan to finance the exploration of new sources of production. Roberto became a partner of Padron in his operation in Miami. And he started promoting the coming of Cubans to explore where we could plant tobacco. My dad tells him, I cannot buy all the tobacco that you have in inventory, but I can certainly help you. They flew him from Managua to Jalapa in 67 for the first time to visit with the president, with Somoza. And Somoza asked him what he thought about the tobacco. My dad said, this tobacco is I mean, this is the second coming of Cuba. 
So whatever you've heard about this tobacco, forget about it. I, I am telling you that this is excellent tobacco. The love from my grandfather for our family name and everything, giving up was not, was not an option. So I said, Dad, we have to stay in handmade cigars. He said, well, you know, we're going to have to move. And my father went to Mexico. He was in Puerto Rico for a while. Nothing really worked. And we got an opportunity through the Angel Oliva family again, talked to us about going to Nicaragua because all the Cuban exiles of Cuba in the very early 60s were going to Nicaragua and Honduras. And President Somoza was uh, giving a lot of opportunity to people in the cigar industry to come to Nicaragua with all the financing, all the opportunity. It was only two million people living in that huge country uh, to come in and to educate the people and learn the industry of hand-making cigars. My grandfather was one of them that know how to grow tobacco, so they started, they started to develop the tobacco program here in Nicaragua. And that's why my family came here, and that's why we stay here. We had been dealing with the Royal Bank of Canada since 1907 in Cuba. My father suggested that we go to the Royal Bank in New York and ask for a loan. The four other elders told my father he was crazy. We have no collateral. How are we going to get a loan? My father said, let's go to New York anyway. And the worst case is they tell us no, back to square one. So they sent my father to New York, and he went to a meeting with the big wigs of the Royal Bank, then 1961, in New York, 68 William Street. I'll never forget that address. He explained the situation, and he asked for $150,000 with the explicit information that we had no collateral. The answer of the Royal Bank was, is that all you need? And they gave us $150,000 unsecured. And with that money, we came to Dominican Republic and restarted the leaf brokerage business in August of 1961. I will never forget that. And my gratitude to the Royal Bank will be until I die. OK, you can't get Cuban tobacco. It's a bad hand. That's the way you're dealt. What can you do about it? None of the other cigar manufacturers were willing to pay the high price of Cameroon wrapper, which is about 50% more than the other wrapper they've been using. So dad tried it with, uh, he loved the taste. He came out the Quest Trade number 95. And for a number of years, Quest Trade was the top selling premium cigar in the country. Cameroon wrapper is what really helped us survive the uh, Cuban embargo. We went to Nicaragua because we were also told that uh, General Somoza president was a graduate of West Point, and it was the most secure place in the world. Well, we were doing very well. We got there in 73. In 1978, all hell broke loose. And my father was happy to get, you know, he was lucky to get out alive. The problem was that in Nicaragua, there was a civil war. My father was caught in the middle of it. Uh, by that time, he had been in Nicaragua for about six, seven years. Había unos compañeros de la revolución que estábamos muy, muy, muy juntos, muy amigos. Me dijeron, padrón, si te vas, no, yo, no, me, no dejes de ayudarme. Cada vez que aquí se daba una fiesta, se hablaba de los prisioneros de Cuba. In the mid 70s, he was approached with the opportunity to go to Cuba and help negotiate the release of political prisoners. Salimos seis de aquí. Entonces llegamos a La Habana a las siete de la noche. Cuando llegamos allí, lloré. ¿Sabe por qué? Porque me habían traído que mi padre, que hacía 18 años que no lo veía, a la verdad, para que me esperara en el avión. Que yo es un gesto bueno de ellos para mí. So he had interactions with Fidel in the late 50s on two separate occasions. Now they're at this meeting, and Fidel turns to my father and says, you know, Orlando, I, I hear you're making good cigars in Nicaragua. And my father says, well, I mean, that's what people say. He goes, let me try one. So my dad gives Fidel a cigar. <laughs> Una periodista de aquí que se llama Edgar. Edgar Silva. Edgar Silva. Me tira la foto. 
Padrón Comunista, aquí en Miami. Most people understood that the reason why they were there was a humanitarian mission, which at the end freed 3,600 political prisoners. So most people understood the nature and were rational about the, about the situation. Some were not. In Nicaragua, está la revolución andando. Padrón es un gusano. Es decir, allá me quema la fábrica, una buena producción, y aquí me empieza a llevarme de bomba. Padrón traidor. Padrón comunista. Bomba y cuatro o cinco bombas me dieron. Pero las pasé y aquí estoy. By the 1980s, just about every large-scale rolling operation had moved outside of the United States, and business was slow. In the 1980s, the cigar business really sucked. Every year, business was going down 4 or 5 percent. Business was awful. Miami had a lot of small operations, small cigar factories, with the immigrants from Cuba. The cigar makers were starting to get into retirement age, and that became a, a problem in paying them. They had to pay him under the table. And that created situations where people started looking elsewhere for supplies of cigars. Dominican Republic was an ideal place to establish a cigar factory to supply. The market was slow. We sell cigars and we grow, but really step by step was more difficult. My small factory, Tabadon, in 1984, only with six rollers, I take the decision that no involve in marketing. All my effort was in production. My dream was to create a company vertical integrate, control from the sea to the final packaging. And my philosophy, this is the only way and you can guarantee the consistency in, in the cigar. I think this is one of the reasons that Davido select my factory when they leave from Cuba. And that was a perfect marriage. After we lost everything in Central America, uh, my father said, Dominican Republic is the country that I always want to go to. Reminds us so much of our heritage, everything. As a young boy, as, as far back as I could remember, the thought of not having him next to me one day was would terrify me the most. And still today, my father is my mentor, my teacher, my hero, my best friend. You know, I walked to the factory and I would see something and I would hear my father's voice of something he told me 35 years earlier. Carlito. If this ever happens, this is what I would do. I talked to Carlos Sr. almost every day, every other day for 30 years. I think about him every day. I think he had an eighth grade education, but he was the smartest guy I ever knew. He had vision, and he solved problems, and he just uh, was an all around incredible person. Carlos Fuente is, is the most unusual, most remarkable man I'd ever met. His bond, is his word. He, he was very soft-spoken. He was a visionary. He was a top-notch mechanic, great tobacco man. I mean, innovative. Things you never think of. Unbelievable guy, okay? I can't say enough about him. And then Carlito has just uh, taken that business and, and, and done a wonderful job with it because you can tell he loves what he's doing. He just loves the business. My father was the kind of person that said that the word impossible doesn't exist. I realized that to make a great product, you have to have origin. It's like a great cheese from Holland or perfume from France or a chocolate from Belgium. There was a group that we brought from France. And I remember the president of the retail association, uh, Mr. Mature. I remember that he walked around the factory and goes, oh my God, Carlito, what I see here this is like what I remember going to Cuba uh, 30 years ago. And this is what family, passion, you've accomplished so much is incredible. But the only thing, you never will be a great cigar producer. 
and I said, what do you mean won't be a great cigar producer? He says, you're assembling cigars. A great producer of cigars has to produce the, all the wrapper, binder, and filler because the wrapper is the crowning glory of the cigar. That went to my inner self and just floored me. I went to all my colleagues, I went to people in the industry, and they said, no, no, you, don't, you can't grow wrappers in this country. Everybody's already tried and they failed. But I knew I had to do it. There was a big controversy that began that we were gonna fail. Some of our colleagues in the Dominican Republic would go to my father and say, Carlos, you know, your son is gonna ruin the business. What is the need to take a risk and lose everything? My father just says, follow your dreams, gave me support. The problem was that that day, the government of the United States had declared that it would impose embargo on Nicaraguan products. Well, they felt that Nicaragua was falling down into the hands of the communists, and they did not want to reproduce the experience they had with Cuba, in this case, with Nicaragua, 20 years later. Los comandantes militares que fueron entrenados en Cuba son los que manejan las armas ahora en Nicaragua. I truly believe that to do nothing in Central America is to give the first communist stronghold on the North American continent a green light to spread its poison throughout this free and increasingly democratic country. And from that moment, no exports would be able to reach the American soil. And here we were, with millions of cigars, a lot of tobacco, and a lot of people depending on their lives. In aquí en la producción solo habían como unos 10 parejas, pero se fue creciendo y se fue creciendo con con el deseo y la voluntad que teníamos nosotros de que siguiera adelante la empresa, porque no era posible que se cayera siendo una buena empresa y tenía un buen prestigio desde que inició. Entonces, aquí estamos luchando siempre, siempre adelante. At that point, we had to cease all operations in Nicaragua, and we shifted all of the production to a second factory that we had opened up in Honduras in 1979. To put it in perspective or in, in context, the first year that my dad started this company, which was in 64, he sold about 20,000 cigars between September and December. And in 1985, we were producing close to 6 million cigars a year. Then the embargo came, and we had to you know, stop production in Nicaragua, and we then focused all of our efforts on Honduras. My father made the strategic decision to only use Nicaraguan tobacco and to use as much as, he, as what he had, because he didn't want to change the blends on the cigars. And that would then cause problems for him with all of the customers that he had built over the years. By the time that the embargo ended, which was in 1990, our production was down to close to a million cigars a year. To be producing six million cigars a year, one year, to end up four years later making a million? I mean, how many people do that? I mean, you gotta have a long-term vision in order to make that type of sacrifice, okay? And honestly, I don't know what I would have done if I was in his shoes. I gotta close my eyes for this one. My perfect cigar, moment would be palm trees, the sound of crashing water, some De Leon Leona on the rocks, some beautiful smelling women nearby, and a bunch of my favorite friends talking shit. For me, the ideal setting for a cigar would have to include all my family, especially anywhere that's by the beach and anything that has live music. And it would have to be like a well-aged Maduro and preferably a Lancero. I think cigars are a lot like art in a sense. You know, what I do is I take a few hundred dollars of materials on stage or in a studio, and I put them together to bring value to something that never existed before. The materials separated are just commodities. And when you bring them together, it's sort of like the stamp in time. You know, that's, there's only one. The process of, you know, taking tobacco leaves and 
as they put them together. It's sort of like how I take the colors and create different combinations of images because, you know, no cigar is the same. So when I'm on stage and I'm creating in minutes to music, that's a moment that is a stamp in time is done. When you're sharing a cigar in conversation, it's very much like that. And as this thing burns, you appreciate every single part of it. Bueno, siempre estamos descubriendo diferentes combinaciones, diferentes variedades de tabaco. Siempre está reinventando. Yo hago los primeros cigarros, yo personalmente. Y le digo cómo distribuir y cómo poner las hojas en cada uno de los puros. Cómo hacer las mezclas. Lo fumamos y determinamos si está bien o no está bien, si hay que ponerle algo, si hay que quitarle algo, pero siempre funciona ese equipo así. The best times I've had are amongst my cigar family. They don't just take you in, you become part of the family. So blending is the artistic part of the job. It's, uh, That's where he's the expert, <laughs> trying to put together those aromas, the balance and the persistency to give uh, a profile, a character uh, to the cigar. Through the cigars, great stories and great friends have uh, come about. In my situation, it was unusual because I started building humidors knowing really nothing about humidors, not even knowing what a humidor was. I was very appreciative to a gentleman that wanted to help me loan some money to finish my sailboat, which I was building. I took some wood from my boat, which is teak wood, and I made him a special three cigar case. He saw my future. I gave it to him, he looked at it, he said, take it down to Dunhill, and I'm sure they will place an order with you. And I made one case to hold every one of the Dunhill cigars. So I thought I'd really impressed him. And I have to say that my heart fell because he didn't even like them. He says, these are okay, but can you make a humidor? And I says, sure, Carl, I can make a humidor. What's a humidor? <laughs> Three weeks later, I came back, went in the office and he wrote me the $250,000 order. In the 1980s, the cigar industry seemed doomed. Yet by the mid-1990s, cigar makers couldn't keep up with demand. What changed? The backdrop is that cigars consumption, the handmade premium cigar, have been declining for the last 40 years. And it got to a point where cigar makers were telling their children not to come into the business. I went on a trip to Cuba in 1991 out of the blue, I came up with the impulse that I don't want to die without having a cigar magazine. The first issue of Cigar Aficionado came out in July of 1992, and that was the catalyst that provoked the boom. We went from, for the sake of argument, 92 million in 1991 to at the height of the boom, 1997, 570 million units sold in the United States. The growth was unmanageable, almost. Since you're editing this, I'll tell you, I want to be the first guy in line to kiss his ass, OK? <laughs> because I think he's the one that uh, got this thing rolling. I never forget the day that I met Marvin Shank. And I remember we had a great meal. I remember a big lobster. And Marvin was with jeans and a t-shirt. I had no idea about what Wine Spectator was and Marvin's prior success. He was just there saying how much he loved cigars and so forth. I remember my father told Marvin, Marvin, you got a lot of, uh, it, it starts with a B, but intestinal fortitude, you got a lot of balls. He said, uh, as long as you have a magazine, you can count on my advertising. I remember telling my father, I said, Dad, did you see those rates? We can't afford that. He goes, Carlito, don't worry. It's gonna last one issue, two issues, and everything. It's not gonna last long. That was 25 years ago. I was trying to drum my business so I'd have some advertising. And he said to me, not only will I take an ad in the first issue, but I'll take an ad in every issue you publish for the rest of your life. Now, nobody ever said that to me. Two or three years later, he said to me he thought he was buying one ad. <laughs> I said, really? That's great. Good luck. <laughs> it was hard to imagine a cigar magazine uh, really having any kind of 
importance. He says, you know, this is what you do. Come to the first big smoke in New York City that we're going to do and uh, see what I'm talking about. Literally, we sold $20,000 worth of humidor. So right after that, I was in with Cigar Aficionado. I said, this is really, you got something here in the, from the very first issue. Fortunately, Marvin Schenken liked cigars. He wanted to do to the cigar industry what he did to the wine industry. He came out with Cigar Aficionado. He created that wave. Cigars became so sexy and so trendy. So many movie stars, uh, athletes. It was like hula hoops, cabbage patch styles. Yeah, everything mixed into it to one. Cigars were so popular. The big change was that people used to be brand loyal. And after the publication of Cigar Aficionado, it was like, I'll take three of these, two of these, one of these, I want to try this, I want to try that. And it really changed the uh, consumer perspective. The years and years of perseverance that uh, all of us as a family put into it, and primarily my father with his uh, excellent gift of blending, uh, came to fruition with that story about us, you know, this small factory on 8th Street. And it was something amazing. We were at a trade show, and basically it was kind of slow as usual, and I remember all the orders were handwritten, and he stepped out for a moment. And I think the first high rating on Cigar Aficionado had been released on the Wavell. So he comes back, and there's a whole line of people just waiting. And he's like, what's going on here? So then I think that that was the first clue that we were going to be OK. You know, that, that was also a very, very fulfilling moment for us as a family. There's a cigar boom that nobody ever anticipated. It was great, but also caused problems. There was no aged tobacco on the market. So cigars became a cash crop. In the Dominican Republic, forget growing their fruits and vegetables. Everybody started growing tobacco. Demand was going up and up and up, and the supply was not able to keep up with demand. Tobacco prices increased, doubled every six months. And finally, supply caught up with demand. I think it was December of 1997. That was the peak of the cigar boom. The boom created havoc in the now established cigar growing regions, with manufacturers fighting to keep relationships with growers as well as with their own employees. The boom, crazy boom. Everybody wanted cigars. We have many new companies, people that did know nothing about the, to the tobacco, they don't know nothing about the industry. Everybody want to be in the cigar industry. Those people came with cash and a lot of money, and they were buying everything. They, they just, it's no matter good quality, bad quality. Many farmers that grow other products like beans, bananas, they, they, they cut the plantation for begin to grow tobacco because the price was three, four times what it used to be. So everybody think that that would be that would be forever. So at some point, uh, we had uh, a little war between companies. Everybody was just trying to, you know, they're trying to make a quick buck. It was the year of Don Nobody's, and you know, tobacco was being sold at crazy prices. It wasn't fermented. The Wild West came during the boom years, from 92 to 98. Yes, those were the wild days. Santiago in 92 had maybe seven cigar factories. At the height of the boom, there were 125 cigar factories in Santiago. And that put a lot of pressure on tobacco on the farms, put a lot of pressure on cigar makers because whoever showed up and wanted to start a cigar factory, the easiest way was to steal cigar makers. It was something no one's ever seen anything like it in their entire lives. People would come with suitcases of cash, not only to buy cigars, but to try to start up factories. It got out of hand. Uh, in 1995, we lost 500 cigar makers of people hiring them away. It was crazy. We had customers that we served, okay, and we, and we were not going to take tobacco away from them to give it to someone else. And I had people say, why aren't you going to do that? I'll pay you more. And I said, listen, man, if I do that for you today, I'll do it against you tomorrow. But you know, this, this is fleeting. It's going to be this way now, and it's going to go away. So you don't do it that way. We were pirates. We would steal cigar makers. We would steal whatever we could get our hands on and use them to benefit 
ourselves instead of the group. Companies that came onto the scene during the boom went bust, but a formidable few remained when the dust settled. I came in just as a business uh, to make money, but somehow I got trapped and seducted by the aroma of tobacco. Imagine yourself trying to drink water from a fireman's hose. It's a lot of information coming to you, and there's very little you can take at a time. I realized that the boom, which we kind of uh, were in the middle of when we launched the company, was coming to an end. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of startup cigar companies. Most of them were going out of business, and I didn't want to be another one of them. At the same time, I had a law practice. This is something I did as a hobby, and everyone told me, you'll never make it. You know, this is a business that has to be handed down from generation to generation. So when somebody tells me I can't do something, that got my antlers up and I said, all right, I'm gonna show you guys. After serving five years in the United States Navy, what I did is I wanted to get in the cigar industry. So I called my father and I said, dad, I'm gonna get in the cigar industry. And he said, you're crazy. Bill Clinton's president, he's regulating and taxing everything. And there's a lot of non-smoking laws. I questioned my father when he told me that. I said, dad, you told me that I live in the greatest country in the world, that I contain anything I want, so I'm gonna give it a shot. And my father didn't say anything when I said that. There was a lot of uh, sleepless nights, and it was so challenging that it, it just became a fascination. I just wanted to learn more and more and more. So I literally went down to Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican. I spent a lot of time asking dumb questions, working in the farms and the fermentation and the curing, making thousands and thousands of blends to educate my palate. And we'd make a great blend, but we'd let other people make the cigar, and they'd always cheat the system. They'd change the binder. They wouldn't ferment the tobacco enough. They might change one of the leaves. I said, I'm going to start out of my garage, and I'm going to buy tobacco from some of the brokers, and I'm going to make cigars and try to make try to supplement my income and see if I can get into this. I couldn't grow. I mean, there was no way to grow. And, you know, I was producing like 300,000 cigars a year, and we had a million cigars in back order. I think it was in 2001 when we took control. That's when I decided I was going to put my name on the cigar, and then never looked back since. In 1995, I called my father, who was retired at the time, and I said, Dad, I sold a million cigars. So he said, well, maybe you're not so much of a moron. My greatest struggle was when my dad died. That was, that was the hardest struggle for me. I remember in the, in the early, in the mid 90s, I had, a, I, had a, I had my son Nicholas, a baby, and um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I'd call my parents and say, you know, I'm having a tough time. I don't, you know, I'd like to eat dinner at the house because I didn't have any money. In business, when you work so hard, you have your ups and downs. As I saw how hard my father had to sweat and work, and I think it helped us a lot, me and my brother, by uh, working hard and doing the right thing also. So my parents were very instrumental in our lives. By the turn of the new millennium, in just four short decades, the families that left Cuba and those who relied on Cuban tobacco for production had taken these tiny rural communities in the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua and transformed their economies. Santiago in 1961 compared to Havana was very distant. Today, and I am proud to say that Santiago has become quite a city. In Dominican Republic, in countries like ours, if you don't walk, you don't eat. Esteli in the last 25 years has grown by leaps and bounds. The investment there, the amount of money that comes into SLE, providing jobs, and just the development of SLE is, it's hard to quantify. I mean, unless you've been there and you've seen it, like I have in the last 25 years, you, you really, it's hard to put it into words. In the 90s, going to Nicaragua, to use a phone, I mean, you had to go to a, 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 like an office in the middle of the town where you would go to a receptionist, give her a phone number, and she would dial the number for you, and then she would tell you, okay, pick up phone number three. Never in my life would I think that you could buy a car here. I couldn't buy a bottle of water here when I first came in. Now we have six dealerships, 25, 30 restaurants in the town. There's literally over $10 million minimum a week funneling through the town from people getting paid. Cada día ves mejores construcciones, 
mejor forma de vida, mejores comercios, mejores mercados, mejores viviendas. Estelí es una ciudad que no tiene desempleo. Creo que es la única ciudad en Latinoamérica que no tiene desempleado aquí. La fuerza de trabajo hay que traerla para completar de otras ciudades porque Estelí no alcanza las personas para trabajar en todos los centros de trabajo que hay. Yo sí veo que Nicaragua va avanzando y creo que va mejorando en todos los aspectos. In all the different factories, the one common thing is that people are happy. If I could implore anyone who's outside of like cigar industry or even just non-cigar smokers to invite them to visit a factory to see how many people are affected and how many people love what they're doing. I mean, it's such an art. So when you see the rollers and you go into a factory, they're proud. They, they want you to come in there. They greet you with smiles. I mean, they're, they're happy that you're taking the time to visit their country to see, you know, what it is that they're doing. And it's, again, it's just such an art. <laughs> Me gusta lo que hago. He mejorado mis condiciones de vida. He sacado a mis hijos adelante en sus estudios. The premium cigar companies uh, over the last 10 to 20 years have created so many jobs there. We've built hospitals, infrastructure, roads, wells for drinking water. Uh, you know, there's so much that we provide to the community besides wages and the fact that the families can feed themselves and many of the fellow manufacturers are doing a lot of great charitable work. In 2004, we bought 23 acres in the poorest area of the Nick Republic, opened up a, uh, a primary school, and we started the Scar Family Charitable Foundation. We had over 800 people opening day, the parents, the media, the politicians. Yay, look at us, we did great. Thrilling day. When I first met these children in the community, when I started coming to with the project of growing wrappers in Chateau de la Fuente. These children are running up to me, asking me for money, see if I could give them anything, a gift or whatever. And he asked them, why aren't you in school? They said, I don't, it doesn't really matter. I feel secure because I'm gonna become a millionaire. I said, how are you gonna do that? He said, oh, I had a cousin that went to New York. You get on these little boats, you get to an island. Next thing, got friends in New York, was there for eight months, came back with gold watches and gold chains. I'm gonna go to New York. About six months later, Carlos called me and said, we have a problem in our school. The problem is, a bunch of the eighth grade girls got a hold of him and said, Mr. Fuente, we love our school, but there's no high school around. The closest high school is an hour away walking. We need a high school. Carlos calls me up and says, we have to build a high school. He says, Carlito, we have no money to build a high school. So he and I co-signed a loan for a million dollars at the Bank of Tampa to build a high school, which we did. Then we built a medical clinic and ball fields, amphitheater. We start with five communities using our project. Now we have over 15 or 16. Now these, these young men and women, because I can't say children anymore, they're professionals. Instead of going to New York without an education and selling drugs and being in gangs and causing problems, they're professionals. We've instilled in them the meaning of giving back. The positive impact of the cigar families on these regions is undeniable, and the cigars coming from them have garnered international acclaim in their own right. But how do they stack up against Cuban cigars? Aunque reconozco que que algunos países como Nicaragua, Dominicana, han hecho un gran trabajo con el tabaco, pero su sabor, su aroma, su fortaleza, no nunca se va a poder comparar con el tabaco cubano. There are many Cubans that know a lot of tobacco, and there are so many Cubans that also doesn't know a lot of tobacco. Talk a lot, and doesn't know a lot. And you're talking about uh, cigars coming out of Cuba. At one point, I can tell you right now that you know, you buy a box of cigars, you were lucky out of 25 cigars, or 12 of them or 13 of them grew. They had to retrain a lot of people that didn't really have a love for the business. We have some cigars not so good. My HR for Nicaragua are better than many Cuban brands, but the good ones, Cuban cigars, are absolutely the best cigars in the world. A Cuban cigar is my favorite cigar and my least favorite cigar, and I love Cubans, but the consistency of them isn't so great. You think about who invented the wheel, right? When it comes to cigars, Cuba invented that, that cigar wheel. I believe that they're making bad wheels right now. Every cigar manufacturer wants to make a cigar that will 
be comparable to Cuba of old. I wouldn't say that anyone has a monopoly on the best cigars. I think there are great cigars from Cuba, great cigars from Dominican Republic, great cigars from Nicaragua. The development of the non-Cuban cigar over the last 20 years has vastly exceeded what anyone thought would be possible. The quality produced both from a agriculture standpoint as well as from a cigar making standpoint um, is just as good as what Cuba makes today. In the decades since the boom, new names have emerged onto the scene, many of whom have taken cues from the old Cuban traditions but have not been afraid to experiment. Bueno, yo estoy oliendo a tabaco desde que nací, porque nací en una fábrica de tabaco. En mi casa había una fábrica de tabaco. Yo comencé en Cuba como torcedor ya a la edad de 11 años. A la edad de 22 años ya yo tengo mis logros en lo que es el tabaco de exportación. Por 13 años consecutivos fui vanguardia nacional en Cuba y alcancé las medallas de hazaña laboral que eso lo daba nada más que el Consejo de Estado a la gente que hacían grandes cosas por el tabaco. Tengo la medalla de hazaña laboral, todavía la tengo, es mía. Proeza laboral y gané en todas las competencias de tabaco que se participó en Cuba. Que yo participé, siempre gané el primer lugar. He is truly a master. I only know a few. When I say a master, you talk about wine, master sommeliers. They can taste a glass of wine and go, that's from this region and this country. They truly know their craft. They know how to make it. They know how to taste it. They know how to blend it. They know how to do everything. Papin's that. Yo creo que tabaquero, tabaquero. Yo fui de los últimos en salir de Cuba con esos conocimientos. Papin Garcia is probably one of the best cigar makers who came out of Cuba and started up in Nicaragua. That's his success. I remember meeting Pepin Garcia when he first came to Nicaragua. I think this was 2003. I would just sit and listen to, you know, what he had to say about tobacco and how he was rolling, rolling cigars up and, and trying some of the blends that he was working on. It was just always a really awesome time to hear from somebody that had you know, years in Cuba and was so passionate about tobacco. I just pick up whatever I can learn. I was actually working at a place, a very historic cigar club called the Grand Abandon Room, and I had the dream to make my own cigar because I wanted to feel like that I was part of a new generation of cigar makers or cigar designers. And in 2003, I kind of gave up that dream. And then one day, an old friend called me and said, Pete, I got a guy that might be able to make you a great cigar. And in walks Pepin Garcia. And I knew within like an hour conversation of, with Pepin Garcia that this was the guy that would be able to make a cigar that I would truly want to put my name on. Y recuerdo que él me pidió un tabaco fuerte. Y yo le hice un tabaco fuerte. Entonces me pidió más fuerte. Y le dije, bueno, ya más fuerte eso va a estar fuerte con cojones. Es una mala palabra en Cuba. Y entonces me dijo, ese es el nombre del tabaco. Y le puso el nombre cojones, cojonú. Es una mala palabra en Cuba. Pero bueno, eso fue lo que el pillón se le quiso poner y así lo vende. Y ahí comenzó nuestra amistad y, y, y comenzamos a hacerle el tabaco. When Papin met me, I don't think he understood, like, what the deal. He didn't know who I was. I knew he was a cigar roller. I had no idea of his history and his talent. It was one of those, like, who's this guy? And then they heard the name, Tatawai. And they're like, who would want to have a cigar called Tatawai? Tattoo, what does that even mean? And they saw me walk into the room, and they're like, OK, we get it. That's the guy that wants to have a cigar called Tattoo. And then I pulled out old Cuban cigar boxes. And he's like, oh, you want this? And I was like, I want that. I want a history. I might be the weird kid with tattoos on my arms and have a brand name named Tatuaje that people can't pronounce, but 
I still respect the history and the tradition of cigar making. I was still working for the Grand Aventa Room. I was still paying my dues behind a counter that I didn't own, working to educate the consumer as much as possible. I took the time of 10 years to do that. I didn't just jump in on day one and say, I'm gonna be a cigar maker. I have a problem with new people coming in the industry that didn't pay their dues at all, that start claiming that they're masters at a craft that I will never claim that I'm a master at. People are flying down to the Dominican Republic, Honduras, and Nicaragua with 10 grand or 20 grand, buy cigars, and then call themselves cigar makers. This is a really hard job. And this is a job that really you have to run with your heart. It's not done with a calculator. And to buy cigars and call, call yourself a cigar maker, I think it's disingenuous. That's just my personal opinion, but I'm a capitalist. People can do whatever they want, and I respect everybody. <laughs> Pet peeve would be people that take credit for other people's work. <laughs> Sometimes the grandiose stories that are told behind brands that, um, you know, for many years, it was always like vintage tobacco from, you know, 30 years ago. Or All of us were selling basically the same product, dressed differently. These have differences in profile, strength, and all that. Some are better, some are worse, but it's basically the same product. You blend great tobacco with great tobacco, you're gonna make great cigars. You have shitty tobacco with shitty tobacco, you're gonna make shitty cigars. And it's as simple as that. It's not that complicated. It's just another cigar maker, man. Just the same thing, telling the same story. You know, the same autograph, the same picture in the tobacco fields, the same cigar being lit up. The biggest thing is try to be a little bit honest, humble of what you do, because ultimately, none of them make the cigars. It's all these people that make the cigars. They are truly responsible. There's no, you know, nuclear science behind making or selling cigars. But, uh, you know, that's, that's about it. They're trying to make yourself bigger than what you really are just because you're gonna sell a few cigars more, or just because you have a big ego which is obviously the biggest issue that we have here. This is all about the egos, about the people, about the... Don't use that against me, man. They're gonna hate me after this. There's a lot of dishonesty when it comes to, you know, the Cuban market. Cuban cigars have a star power and they, they can do no wrong. They're cashing in on the notoriety. It's all over the news. Everybody sees it. We've been against it for years. I gotta have what I can't, I can't get. It doesn't matter what they put in a cigar. The cigar could be dog shit. People will buy it because it says Cuba on the band or it says Havana on the band. Come on. With Cuban cigar, you, you're not supposed to have it. So it's like the thing you can't have, you want more of. So it's gonna be interesting once the embargo lifts and it opens up, how, how people's perception of Cuban cigars will it have that same cachet, you know, as it once did when you couldn't have it. Because now it's like, oh, is that a Cuban? Oh, how'd you get that? Or what you get a Cuban? What can I say about a country that's communist, that oppresses the bare minimum rights that we are taken for granted so often here in the States? The simplest things are taken for granted. There is no freedom. There are no human rights. There is absolutely nothing. For me, the Cuban cigars are a myth. I would not smoke a Cuban cigar until Cuba is free. Has the Cuban cigar become a myth? Or are families like the Rabinas succeeding in keeping the tradition alive? Future of Cuban cigars is a great future, but with the American market, of course. Uh, I hope very soon many things change. If you understand tobacco and you understand cigars and you taste certain Cuban cigars. I mean like ones that are made at home by Cuban rollers that really care about what they're doing, what they call customs. Some of those cigars are, are beautiful. I roll my own cigar here in my house. That cigar is, uh, is 10 years old, the grow material. Uh, I have the possibility to, to age in the leaves. Then when I want to smoke an old cigar, I just take leaves and I roll my cigars. Many years ago, my first job in tobacco was in the Partagas factory, and also I worked in the Umbank factory, just rolling cigars. But if you pick up a production cigar from Cuba, for me, 
it's full of green tobacco. When I say green, I say raw, under fermented, uh, not completely processed. When you see a country like Cuba, that's this big industry for one family's bank account, they don't care, there's no care. It's, it's the machine. It's them telling a lie of like, we're the best in the world, we're the best in the world. Well, if you actually sat them side by side, they're not, they're not anymore, they used to be. Mañana pueden abrirlo y es cuando se van a dar cuenta en Estados Unidos de que Nicaragua hoy en día es el mejor puro del mundo. I want to produce the cigars inside the farm with the HR brand, means my name, Hirochi Robaina. So then in the future, when many things change here, we have the possibility to, to change. I don't want to produce a cigar in another factory because then I don't have the control of that. I want to produce my cigar in my farm because we produce the best tobacco in the world and American customers need to, to, to try to smoke the best tobacco in the world. We are 45 minutes away, so it's incredible that. So I hope very soon everything change and, uh, and it's moment to start. We are Americans. We are Latino Americans. And our, our culture is American. You can see people here in Cuba watching a baseball game. Baseball is our national sports in the United States and in Cuba also. When it's United States with another country, Cuban people like United States win. Between Cuba and United States, of course, we want Cuba win. They called me at 2 o'clock in the morning and they told me Fidel died. The Cuban flag was flowing from every car, every window. I remember seeing the footage of the celebrations in Miami when Castro died. It almost mirrors the images in Havana when Castro came in to free Cuba of their supposed last, last dictator. Last of Cuba. Now, there's hope. One more down. Let's wait for the next one. For 450 years, we we'll live the main, the main and the most important product is the tobacco and the cigar industry. Over 120,000 people live from, from tobacco. Yo sería, yo diría que es una ruina, porque en realidad somos muchas familias las que le dependemos del, del tabaco. The smaller companies will suffer disproportionately to then bigger companies. Just the effort of complying with the regulation makes it impossible for many companies to go into business. It makes it impossible to introduce new products. So what happens is, is that companies that have the market share basically maintain the market share. And those new companies that want to come in can compete for market share because you can introduce new products. If regulation comes, if prices of the products of cigars go up, demand will go down. That means that we will have to cut employment in all of our factories, which means that in the end, they will have to find alternatives. And um, unfortunately, in this country, that's not easy. No, no quiero ni imaginármelo si las leyes vienen tan fuertes, porque los empleados aquí nosotros lo vemos como una familia gigante. Nosotros compramos máquinas para desparillar banda y las vendí. ¿Por qué? Si pones una máquina desempleas 15 o 20 personas. Si tienes tres máquinas, estás dejando de darle empleo a 60 personas que comen de aquí. Entonces, ¿qué estás haciendo? Desempleando personas y haciendo una cosa mecanizada cuando la puedes hacer a mano. Because we are okay, I'm the master blender. I can make a blend, I can make whatever you want to put in together as a as a cigar. But I'm not sitting there eight hours a day to roll cigars. And behind the scenes, 135,000 people working with their hands will be without any jobs. It will destroy families, it will destroy communities. You stop the cigar industry, you stop uh, the economy of that place. But it's fucking scary. Tengo cuatro años de ser casado. Y tengo un hijo de cuatro años. Soy deficiente visual. 
en este momento pues me encuentro trabajando con ustedes y me siento alegre porque hay la oportunidad de poder trabajar y llevar el sustento a mi, a mi hogar. So regulation in the end is not a threat against the business owners, against the people who have their names. We all have savings in the bank. But it's a threat to all of the people who day in, day out come, fill the seats in the back, and work their lives, their livelihoods in making this product. The cigar family as a whole, uh, most people are immigrants that have come from Cuba, from a lot of different countries. We came here with nothing. We've worked very, very, very hard, and there's been a lot of sacrifice. I mean, I personally sacrificed family, friends, relationships to get to where I am. I feel like you can pursue the American dream, and it has been the American dream for many of us. Uh, but at that same time, having said that, that dream could be taken away with the stroke of a pen in Washington. So we're very fearful of that. For every law that we actually pass on the floor and signed by the president, uh, the federal bureaucrats, the unelected people, probably make 100 laws. You know, every day, every member of Congress get a little publication called the Federal Register. So instead of throwing ours into garbage every day, like the other 534 members, we threw them in the corner. In just four years, that stack of federal regulations uh, was actually seven stacks of federal regulations, nearly 70 linear feet. People want a balance in, in government. They want to find that middle ground if you can. It's because, wait a minute, I don't need you telling me everything. I don't need you regulating everything that I do. I can make some decisions for, my, for myself. I believe you also have an FDA that, you know, may not care. And the last thing a regulation should do is put people out of business who can't meet the regulation. This is a clear, this is a clear overreach. You could argue this is a national security issue because when economies collapse in, in, in some of these other countries, uh, what usually fills that void is, is not anything uh, that is good, not anything that'll be good for America. I think that the option number one that would have one in this city if it wasn't the tobacco would be to emigrate. I think there would not be another opportunity to work because in this city everything moves according to the tobacco. All I do is work hard, employ people, and then I get whacked in the head by the government because I'm a bad guy because I make money. But if I didn't, there'd be 4,300 people who wouldn't eat here in Nicaragua, and we'd have several hundred in the United States, not including their families. I think that you go out of business because you're a bad businessman, because you produce a bad product, you're disingenuous. Those are the reasons you go out of business. You don't take the risk, but you shouldn't go out of business because your biggest competitor is your own government. And that's the problem we've been having, and I'm hoping it changes. One cigar, from the moment you plant the seed to the moment that cigar goes through all the different steps, through many, many years of aging and preparation, fermentation, curing, and so forth, it's going to go to 350 pairs of skilled hands. I'm very concerned, not for myself or my family, but for the people who are part of our world that cigars are their life and is their only means for them to have food on their table. But I'm also very concerned for the United States. I'm concerned for the thousands of families who have dedicated generations and it will fall in the hands of two or three multinational big conglomerates that will chew up the world and end up with the entire industry and do anything they want because there'll be no one there to check and balance them. My job is my honor and to protect my family heritage, loyalty to all the people that work side by side with us in this beautiful family industry. We have a lot of people that work with us that have been with us for over 30 years. You know, my father is someone that has always been very compassionate. He's always been very attentive to the needs of our employees. And I think that that's a big reason why we are where we are today. Pero hemos dado como un millón de dólares para escuela, para fundaciones de lo que tenemos. Y me falta verlo a ver si puedo recaudar más para para hacer más. The idea is you build the school, you provide the education, 
and hopefully these kids will develop into professionals. And there's always going to be people that are going to want to make cigars, and there's some that are going to want to be doctors. Engineers, doctors, teachers, uh, uh, they finish their college making cigars. Um, normally when they have class, we let them work only half time. Uh, that's, I feel good about that, that some of them try to uh, don't continue more generation making cigars. So we open a daycare here in front of the factory. The parents are very uh, secure working here while the, while the child and the children are very good taken care of. So it's the way that we have to say thank you for the hard work and the passion and the commitment that they put in every cigar that we make. When people come to this factory, we should aim that when they retire, when they go back home, they have a better standard of living. No, me siento muy cómoda, verdad, principalmente. Y los beneficios que he adquirido, como ya le dije, es sacar adelante a mi familia, a mis hijos, mi hogar. Porque me imagino yo que si no estuviera esta empresa, estuviera varada en el camino. What's going to happen with all these charity organizations that are supported by people who love cigars? What's going to happen to the tens and hundreds of thousands of people who are involved from the agriculture, from everything that's involved with making a handmade cigar? Cigar families have weathered every storm from the unforgiving climate to violent revolution. But can they withstand the growing threat of regulation? Should an unelected body like the FDA be allowed to put thousands out of work and potentially destabilize massive regions of Latin America? Perhaps questions like these are best left to each aficionado. My first cigar, it's not a sexy story. In my fraternity, I was a pledge, went through Hell Week, and they put us all in a closet. We could not come out of that closet till we finished the cigar. I went under the bed, we lighted a cigar, and with the flame of the lighter, the, the bed got on fire. So we have to go <laughs> run, and my mom was wanting to kill me. It was a cigar I stole from a grocery store. I wasn't the greatest of kids when I was younger, but... First time I thought I was going to die. I turned green, purple, blue. But I remember lighting it and hiding in the garden and taking a couple of puffs and going, oh my God. And my mommy said, when your dad gets home, when you're... And I, I respected my dad. He came home that day and I was like very quiet. He looked at me. He didn't say anything and just walked away, but I knew he knew. When they weren't looking, I always put a puff in my mouth and I'd eventually get sick. I threw up all over the place, and my dad was laughing. <laughs> you know, he told, I told you not to smoke that cigar. I had been drinking all day, and it just wasn't a wasn't a good mixture. Lo hice yo mismo. Me sentí un lockdown. A very intimate moment, uh, especially the first moment. It's like having sex for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> After like half half hour, we was biting and. We were feeling bad, sweating. And I was like, man, my mom was back, and she smelled it right away. And she's like, you smoking cigarettes? I was like, no, mom, it was a cigar. She's like, get upstairs and, and wash yourself before your father gets home. Me puse un tabaco en la boca y llegué a la casa haciéndome el gracioso. Y mi abuela me dio un galletazo, pero rompió la cara. I would say I didn't know how to appreciate, you know, what I was trying, but I did appreciate that bonding moment. I was like. Why are people into this? He was up in a tobacco barn on the farm in Cuba. Is that when he saw his dad be, uh, below him in the barn that he ate the, the tobacco that was left? <laughs> 